Fulbright Taiwan is celebrating 60 years of educational exchange and has provided scholarships to over 3,000 grantees. I'm William Vokey, the Executive Director of Fulbright Taiwan. Fulbright sends Taiwanese to America and brings Americans to Taiwan. We send scholars both ways to do research and to teach, students both ways to get graduate degrees and do research, and language teachers both ways to teach either Mandarin or English. Fulbright Taiwan has been an intimate part of Taiwan's economic and democratic development, supported by both the U.S. and Taiwan authorities. The vision of Senator Fulbright was a world with a little more knowledge and a little less conflict. He believed that educational exchange would not only enrich our lives with knowledge, but would also lay a foundation of cross-cultural understanding that could be the basis for a more peaceful world. Our keynote speaker today fits perfectly into that vision. Dr. Michael Sandel teaches political philosophy at Harvard. Newsweek describes him as the most relevant living philosopher or a rock star moralist. The New Republic as the most famous teacher of philosophy in the world. Dr. Sandel has done the impossible. He's made political philosophy fun and engaging without losing its nuance or its depth. His legendary course, Justice, is the first Harvard MOOC to be freely available online and has been viewed by millions around the world, including in China, where China Newsweek named him the most influential foreign figure of the year. Described by The Guardian as the man who is currently the most effective communicator of English in the world, Sandel's book and lectures have brought him the kind of popularity usually reserved for Hollywood stars and NBA players. It's a great pleasure to be here today with LeBron James. Now, Dr. Michael Sandel. It's great to be back in Taiwan. Now, the subject I teach is philosophy, moral and political philosophy. There are some people who think that philosophy resides in the heavens far above the world in which we live. I think philosophy belongs in the city, where citizens gather. Because every time we make a choice about the right thing to do, whether in our public life or in our everyday lives, with our friends and with our families or in business. Every time we choose, we presuppose we commit ourselves to some answer to the kinds of philosophical questions that great thinkers have thought about and written about. Great thinkers going back to Socrates and to Confucius. Now, these days, if you look around the world, there is widespread unhappiness and frustration with the terms of public discourse, with politicians, with established political parties. We see this everywhere. I think one of the reasons for the frustration with public discourse is that we are not very good at reasoning together in public about big questions that matter, including questions about values and ethics. Questions like, what makes for a just society? How should we deal with rising inequality, the growing gap between rich and poor, what do we owe one another as citizens? These are the big questions of values and ethics that people want to think about and reason about and even argue about together. So I think our public life would go better if we overcame the habit of avoiding these questions 
in public discourse. Now, what might a better kind of public discourse look like? One that addressed more directly the big ethical questions that matter and that people care about. Well, to try to answer this question, I would like to engage with you in a discussion of some ethical questions we face today. Are you willing to join me in that kind of discussion? Yes? All right, now you have two different colored pages, is that right? All right, so you're ready? Now, I'm going to put some questions to you, and I want to get your views, and so we'll vote. But more than that, after we vote, I want to hear your reasons, your arguments. Now, I'd like to begin with a question related to justice between generations. I've been reading about the debate going on here in Taiwan about pensions. <laughs> and about the debate about pension reform. And I would like to begin by asking you this question. Consider these two opinions about pensions and pension reform. Opinion one is this. The government should spend less on generous pensions and more on childcare, long-term care, and early childhood education. That's opinion one. Opinion two says even generous pensions that may be expensive represent a promise to an older generation of workers and that promise should not be broken. So two opinions. How many agree? Raise the yellow page. If you agree with opinion one, government should spend less on pensions and more on child care, long-term care, and early childhood education. Now, keep the yellow cards up, and if you agree with opinion two, pensions as a promise, raise the gray card. All right, in this audience, all right, thank you for that. In this audience, uh, it looks like there are more people who agree with opinion one about pensions. So let's begin with those of you who voted for opinion one. And who will begin our discussion by offering us a reason, an argument in favor of the idea that the government should spend less on pensions and more on these other, on these other policies. Tell, first, tell us your name, and then tell us why you voted the way you did. Um, my name is Megan Ferguson, and I voted as I did, partially because I think there's a lot of evidence that supports the idea that the earlier children get education and the longer term their care is, the more they will likely make in their lifetime. And the more a person makes in their lifetime, the more there is available for pensions, even if the percentage that we use for pensions stays the same in the long run or is even cut so that we can spend those funds on other things like this care. So I think overall, by focusing in the short term on turning to care and turning to childhood, we'll be more likely to provide for our elders in the long run. Okay, thank you for that. So Megan makes a long-term argument about what will actually generate funds to grow the size of the economic pie. Let's hear from someone now who disagrees, someone who voted for the opinion that a pension, even what may seem like an overly generous pension, represents a promise to a previous generation of workers. Who will give us his or her reason down here? Dr. Sando, my name is Akira, and my argument is actually simple. I don't think this paying for too much is very fair, but if I can trust the government on this, that they will keep their promise, then I can trust them on anything else. So a promise is a promise. Yes, yes indeed. 
until, and there are some people who are agreeing with you. <laughs> Over here, I can tell. Um, and tell me your name again. My name is Akira, A-K-I-R-A. Yeah. Akira. All right, Akira, keep the microphone for the moment. <laughs> and let's hear from someone who disagrees with Akira. Stand up. Now, wait, t tell us your name, first of all. Hi, everyone. Uh, hi, Dr. Sandel. My name is Jane Wong. Jane? Yes. All right, speak directly to Akira, Jane. <laughs> and you heard his argument, a promise is a promise, it's a basis of trust. What do you say to that? Well, actually, uh, I would like to disagree with both. <laughs> and actually um, agree with both. Uh, in the sense that I think both are important. Um, however, if we remain on only one side, and there's no side that's going to win in the end. And so I propose a third way. Um, it has to be a third way, um, which is that, for example, you keep your promise. Uh, what, what, the, what the elderly need is to have their needs met and to feel secure in their um, golden years, right? And so um, that's... You may not, it may not take the form of a generous pension anymore, um, but you can, you can break down what their needs are. Uh, for example, they, want, they need company, they need care, um, and, but maybe you can um, create a different kind of uh, institution. For example, I heard an idea, I don't know if it exists yet, um, where you can um, combine nurseries with um, elderly care, um, and you create what essentially villages used to do, which is a multi-generational kind of um, place where everyone can interact and have their needs met. So then so you would have childhood education um, and early childhood care along with you know, wisdom from the elderly and then they would be able to accompany the elderly and you, know, you can spend your money um, together that way. All right, so you're looking for an alternative, Jane. You, you aren't, if you don't mind my asking, you're not by any chance considering a career in politics, are you? <laughs> I, would, uh, I am currently working on something I would love to share one day with Fulbrighters, but... Uh, all right. Uh, but, well, but not but politics. Not, not politics. But includes politics. But now, I, I want to... But Akira... I, I watched Akira listening to what you said. And it sounds like, as far as the expectation of retirees, who say they were promised the eight, let's be specific, the 18% annual payout of the lump sum they had accumulated prior to 1995, I believe. Now, for them, Jane's alternative proposal might not be, they might not consider that keeping the promise, though. Do you agree with that? I log about it. <laughs> but yes, they could, but well, we could address their concern. What would, what would you say, Akira? Um, actually, I think I agree with the expectation thing, because I believe that the government did not give them 18% for nothing, so they must have sacrificed something, or the government must have promised them for, because they done something at first. So when they done the sacrifice, they expect to get something back, and now you're taking that away from them is taking the taking the tr trust of our government away. Because now I, can, now I can no longer be sure that when the government promises me that, okay, you do this first now and I will pay you back someday, right. I can no longer trust you. All right, so Akira sticks by the, the moral weight of a promise bound up with trust. Who can address that argument directly? Someone who disagrees with Akira, but who has a, an argument, a reply, to this very strong claim about a promise and trust. Raise your hand if you have a reply. Yes, what do you uh, think? I'll use English for now, okay. sorry. Um, no. I'm Emily. <laughs> and I just kind of want to respond and qualify that. So you say that a promise is a promise, but you also have to take into consideration the context and the time at which the promise was made. Because now, this is years and years later that these pensions are actually being paid back. So you have to consider that the circumstances under which the promise was made may have changed over that time. So that doesn't mean that the significance of the promise is any less, but it might be necessary to sort of alter some of the numbers in order to better echo the circumstances as they are. A quick reply. What do you say? 
um, I believe that's, that's not the person that, that's not the thing that I need to think about. It's the person who gave me, gave me the promise that needs to think about before giving me the promise. All right, so if, if, um, you, if you came to me and said you wanted to borrow um, $100 and you promised to pay it back, and then uh, you promised to pay it back next month, and next month you came and said, well, my circumstances have changed. <laughs> you would still consider that you owe me the money, yes? Yes. yes. What about that? Well, I think we're also looking at a different time span here. So we're talking about years that right. have passed, not just a month, but and years so that have passed. What's between... changed that's relevant so... here? I suppose, uh, just to put a challenge to Akira, well, the, the uh, number of workers who are working compared to the number of people who have retired, that's changed dramatically. Uh, today, even, uh, even about a decade ago, there were nine workers for every, sorry, there were nine workers for every retiree. And today there are six. And with a low birth rate and uh, expanding uh, longevity, people living longer, there are fewer and fewer workers today for every retiree. The ratio is, is shrinking. What do you say to that? Well, well um, I don't think it's if what I'm going to say is politi um, politically correct, but <laughs> um, to, to be honest, those people who, are, who were promised to give this amount of money, um, right. they won't live for forever. They will eventually um, pass away, and then this, this thing will be end for, end for good. So you have to keep, the government has to keep its promise because it's not like it will go on forever and it will just make our nation down. It won't. It All will right. last like for 30 years. All right, so Akira is sticking very strongly to his argument. <laughs> is there someone who in the course of this discussion has begun to change his or her mind or rethink the position with which you began? Is there anyone yet who is beginning to, yes? You are? What's your name? Uh, just call me Raymond. So I originally agree with Akira about, about the position of a promise is a promise, and I think that the government should stick to this promise. Part of it is because not only the government shouldn't be compared to a person. Uh -huh. Since the government's promise is on a larger scale and, on the, and with a more heavier ethical heaviness. Yeah. Yes, so I think it, it should be preserved. But right now I think that, yes, because the government shouldn't be compared to, a, to an individual, so we shouldn't consider them with the classical view of per, personal credit. Right, all right, it's a very interesting suggestion. You've begun to change your thinking. First you accepted the model, the image, the metaphor of an individual promise. Akira to me for the hundred dollars. But as you've thought about it, you've begun to wonder whether a collective promise made by a government or a, a large political community uh, may be somewhat different from a promise that one person makes to another person. Is that right? Yes, indeed. All right. So, and it raises a very interesting philosophical question about the extent to which a government or a political community at a particular historical moment can make a promise or undertake a commitment that morally binds future generations. It's very interesting. And to explore that question, we would have to explore the very interesting philosophical question of whether moral commitments and moral responsibilities, to what extent must they be individual? And to what extent can they be collective and extended across time? I can commit myself 
to repay Akira $100 next month. But can a political community or can a generation make a commitment that binds future generations? Maybe so. But then the question arises, well, just how many future generations? The next generation? What about the one after that? What about a generation a hundred years from now? So this is a very interesting suggestion and, and you're now trying to figure out what you think about the original question. Okay. You're I think wondering... we, we should consider then the government and its society is a collective, um, collective entity and it is right. considered politically, politically continuous. Yeah, very... Yet, so the individual which compares the, the society is, is continually changing. Okay, and very, very good. To a, to a certain extent, you would, you would say that the, the two society in different time points are on a similar right. and, and different. Right. It's very interesting, too, because it raises questions, sometimes very difficult, fraught, controversial questions, about the moral responsibility of one generation to redress wrongs that may have been committed by their grandparents' generation. And that too raises questions about whether moral responsibility can reach across time, whether it can be collective as well as individual, and to what extent do we bear the burdens of moral responsibility for acts our great-grandparents' generation may have committed. I want to thank everyone who's joined in this first round of discussion on pensions. What we already see is beginning with the discussion of a very concrete policy question leads us to some very interesting and important broader philosophical questions. I'd like to shift to a different kind of example, but also a contemporary political and policy question. The use of nuclear power. Now, the Taiwan government has recently announced it's going to transition away from reliance on nuclear power. How many, how many think that's a good idea? How many people are in favor of Taiwan not uh, relying, uh, beginning in the near future, on nuclear power? Raise yellow if you want to transition away. Raise gray if you think Taiwan should continue uh, nuclear power. Here I see quite a mix, more of uh, an even divide. I see a lot of people want to get rid of nuclear power, but about an equal number want to continue with it. Now, here's a related question, I would a question related to nuclear power that I would like to ask you. Let's suppose that for the moment, given the use of nuclear power, there's a need to store the waste somewhere, the radioactive waste. And much of that waste, in the case of Taiwan, as I understand it, is stored is on Orchard, Orchard Island, is that right? Orchid Island? And the people on Orchid Island are not very happy about having more and more nuclear waste stored there. And so the question arises, what to do with it? Now, here's one possible solution I would like to get your reaction to. Suppose there's a country, maybe a poor country somewhere in the world, maybe a number of such countries, who are looking for ways to make money. And suppose countries, including uh, Taiwan, uh, that want to store their nuclear waste somewhere else, enter into a deal with, uh, say, a poor country in Africa. We'll ship you our nuclear waste to store, and we will pay you a good amount of money to accept it. And suppose there are countries willing to accept this deal, to accept monetary payment to store Taiwan's nuclear 
waste. How many people think this would be a good idea, and how many people find it morally objectionable? How many people think it's wrong? Let's, so, let's, if you think it's a good idea, raise the yellow card. If you think it's morally objectionable, raise the gray card. The majority, uh, mixed opinion, the majority seem to find it objectionable. Let's hear from someone who's raised the gray card. Why is it objectionable? What's wrong? If, if both countries agree, what's wrong with it? Who will begin our discussion of nuclear waste disposal for pay, outsourcing, so to speak, nuclear waste storage? Yes, stand up and tell us your name. Hello, my name is Emily. Uh, the question I want to kind of ask in response is, who is truly making that decision? Um, in the poor country that the nuclear waste would be sent to is the decision being made by presumably wealthy, um, well-advantaged politicians where I would not hesitate to say the waste will not be stored in their backyard. Right. <laughs> um, or is that decision made as a country as a whole? Um, so that's kind of where my... That would make a difference. You suspect it will be elites who will make those decisions. Aren't in most decisions made that way? In developing <laughs> countries, and that they won't bear the burden of their choice. Yes, and even if they do, once again, money pays for health care. So if there were health consequences, they would not be as consequential. Would your opinion... What's your name? Um, Emily. Emily, would your opinion differ? You, you said... These are probably not going to be democratically made decisions, but suppose that they were, then would that remove your objection? Um, that would remove that specific objection. I think I have other ones, but that was my primary one. <laughs> all right. Let's see. Uh, all right. Let's see if there are others who have objections. We have one objection from Emily that she doubts that these decisions will be democratically made. They'll be made by, by elites. But suppose for the sake of argument, just to test the principle, that it would be democratically made in the developing country. Uh, does someone have a further objection? Let's hear from someone who favors the idea of paying the country way back in the corner. Stand up. Paying other countries, countries that are willing to accept the waste. What's your name? Hello, my name is Anita. And I think that this is a typical way how to deal with externalities from economical point of view. And let's say this country is really poor, they don't have enough money for schools, for infrastructure. So for storing this uh, waste, they can maybe use this money for building new infrastructure, for improving healthcare, for improving life standard. So why not to use it? Because maybe there will be new scientists who will come from this country, who will in the end find a way how to work with this nuclear power and with this waste, and who will find a solution. So why not to improve a living standard in the country okay. if we can? Good. And Anita, you mentioned this is a classic way of dealing with what you call an externality. You aren't by any chance an economist. Yeah, I have economist background. <laughs> I see. All right. So Anita uh, has provided uh, a strong economic argument in favor of doing this. The country that receives the money can use that money to improve the lives of their people. And let's assume they do. It's true that elites might use it, might squander it on palaces or, or <laughs> private jets. But let's suppose it's democratically decided and suppose the money is used, as Anita suggests, to improve the lives of the people. Who, has a, who disagrees with Anita and has a reply? And I want to say again, if you want to speak in Chinese, feel free in whatever language you prefer. Who has a reply to Anita? Yes. Hi, my name is Tanya. I think this is, today is good. For example, before, they were very strong. They put their waste to Taiwan. And Taiwan today they put it to Taiwan. They put it to Taiwan. 非洲去，那好，那如果今天全部人都提升起来呢？就是连非洲的也开始发展，他们的工业也开始有核废料，那
这些垃圾要往哪边放？放到南极、北极去吗？那南极、北极住的是什么？北极熊，然后海海豹之类的吗？我们要付钱给他们吗？他们要付钱，我们的钱干嘛呢？所以就是，那就是一个垃圾，它它就是存在。但是我自己也觉得很矛盾，因为我刚刚是支持台湾继续有那个核能的，因为我觉得如果台湾持续不发展那个经济的话，会越来越衰败。I don't know if the polar bears have elites who dominate the other polar bears, but let me hear. Thank you for that. Let me hear another object. Is there any further answer to Anita's argument that the country that accepts the nuclear waste for money should be able to make that decision? Both countries are better off. Taiwan is better off. Finds a place to keep the waste. The, the poor country is better off because it makes money that will go to the benefit. We're assuming will go to the benefit of their people, for health, for education, for improvement. Who has an answer to that argument? Yes. Hi, my name is Yuchi.、Um, my response is basically that that's very idealistic.、Um, if Perhaps in the short term, we can provide、uh, the African country can provide better schools and better healthcare. But then afterwards, they're going to pay for the healthcare, right? All those side effects and whatnot. So in the end, they're going to end up paying more money for actually not nothing, right? So maybe ten years of kids will benefit. Decision.、Sure. And so the policy is. All right, you think it's wrong to outsource to an African country? We'll give a financial payment to communities domestically here in order to compensate them. Do you like that idea, in principle, better than the outsourcing? Well, I was more so responding to this idealistic、um, kind、But、of view. But what do you think, faced with those two choices, which would you prefer? I don't like either of those choices. Why don't we go back to the original choice where Taiwan's cutting the?、Um, so you'd get rid of nuclear power altogether. I mean, I I would defer to Emily over here. She, she right. So you want to get rid of it altogether,、there. but while it exists, is there anything? What What do you say? Go ahead.、Um, what I wanted to say was,、uh, well, my opinion in general about two people who who agree, who make agreement and are informed. When they're making that agreement, is that people who are outside of those those two, you know, people's countries who are making that agreement should should respect that, you know, respect that they've made that choice, they bought that risk. Just like when、uh, Taiwan is creating、uh, nuclear waste, there is a, a risk that no one will buy that nuclear waste and they will have to sit with it. Right. And it might、um, cause health, you know. Right. Health issues, and just like、um, an African country who decides to buy the、um, buy the nuclear waste, if they made that decision, being well informed, they are paying for that.、Uh, they're getting that money, and they are receiving that risk. That is the cost、right. of the money. Right. So if both sides are well informed, yes, including the country that、yeah. buys the risk, they they understand what the risk is.、Mm-hmm. Whether they're buying it lo- domestically、yeah. in a particular community or in Africa, yeah. So、I、long think- as they're informed and they come to an agreement, a deal is a deal.、Yeah. It's a voluntary exchange,、yeah. and some, and, and so nobody should criticize it. Yeah. What What is your name?、Uh, my name, Lena. Lena.、Mm-hmm. All right.、Uh, you have a repl- do you disagree with Lena?、Yeah. All right. Why do you? All right. Stand up and tell us why. Hi, my name is Destiny.、Um, I don't have that much to say, but I think that you have to take into into consideration that the other country is probably underprivileged, very poor, and so I want to compare this situation to say somebody who's starving on the streets and working in the sex industry. Like, is that really their choice to sell their? You know, they know they know what they're doing. They're informed. Right. But. They're hungry. Yeah. So what's what's the lesser of the two evils? Okay, great. Let's go back and let Lena reply. You know, then that's the prostitutes. If they're this is like the the example you gave was that it was a de- democratic 
decision. The whole country right. made that decision right. to to take in the waste. Yeah. So if if let's just put that example to the um, uh, the prostitute. If they right. did it out of uh, yes, out of necessity, shouldn't it be them who decides whether they want food or not, um, right. and how they decide to get that food. Um, all right, but that's, then let me, let me take, you used an interesting that. word just now. Yeah. If they, you're following the analogy, the challenge, destiny's challenge, yeah. to, to, the, to the voluntary yeah. deal. Unless, okay. Wait, Unless, wait, let me, you okay. said, suppose the prostitute yeah. does it out of necessity. Yeah. Now, is a choice mm -hmm. made out of necessity or extreme poverty, is that truly a choice? That's destiny's challenge, right? Yeah. Well, it's, Destiny says it's not a real choice. What do you say? It's not a real choice, but if I, I think that unless the person outside of you who, who is making that not, not an, that, okay, forced decision, unless someone is willing to give you that food, give you that money, then I don't think they should be a part of that. Do you know what I mean? If, if Destiny I think says I you do. shouldn't do that, I then I think Destiny I do. should, should, if Destiny can help. Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't mean to... No, but wait yeah. a minute. So you accept, you accept uh. the force of Destiny's analogy yes, to prostitution. Yes. yes. And you say, even in the case of a prostitute who's very poor, mm. the prostitute makes a kind of choice, even under necessity. Yeah. If, and if that should be it. permitted. I, I think it's a, like I, I'm not I'm not saying prostitution is like you should do it okay I'm not promoting it okay I'm just putting that out there but, but it's permissible I, I it's just morally don't, permissible if it's I don't think chosen. I should judge them is what I'm saying I don't think I should judge them for the decision that they made okay yeah. now what's interesting if you thank you for that um, Thank you for everyone who's joined in this discussion of the nuclear waste outsourcing. Couple of observations. First, you notice how this argument unfolded. We began with a collective policy question. One country selling its nuclear waste to another country, a poor country. And as we began to think about the moral arguments for and against this transaction, we found ourselves drawn to an individual example. Just as we did in the earlier case, the case about the promise, we found ourselves testing a policy choice, a collective decision by analogy to an individual choice. Borrowing $100, promising to repay next month. And then the suggestion, but how good is that analogy? An analogy between what a country does or a political community does and what an individual may do. And here in the discussion of outsourcing nuclear waste, we found ourselves in a discussion of what really is a free choice. What is a voluntary deal? And there too, the argument by analogy invoked an individual choice by a prostitute whether or not to sell her body or his body. And the second interesting feature of the way this argument unfolded was it became an argument about how much necessity, how much desperation is consistent with a voluntary transaction. Just how poor is the country that is agreeing to buy, sorry, to, to take the nuclear waste for pay? How free is the choice? It's related to, I suppose, to the worry about elites rather than a democratically decided choice. How free, really, how voluntary is the choice? And if necessity or desperation is lying in the background of the choice, does that undermine the initial thought that a voluntary exchange is a mutually beneficial deal? 
as economic reasoning introduced by Anita suggests. A deal is a deal. Both parties to a deal make a choice about what's in their interest. And it's not for some third party, some outside observer, to judge. That was one argument. And the counter-argument was, but if an outside observer or anyone can determine that there was necessity or coercion or desperation, maybe the market logic, the logic of the voluntary deal is called into question or should be called into question. I'd like to take a third case of an issue that's been debated recently in Taiwan. Same-sex marriage. <laughs> you know that the highest court has ruled that prohibiting same-sex marriage is a violation of the equality embedded in the Taiwan Constitution. I'm trying to tread delicately here. <laughs> and some people, and left it to the legislature to figure out how to change the law to make it consistent with equality. They've given the legislature two years to do this. There are some people who are in favor of same-sex marriage, of the law recognizing same-sex marriage. There are other people who are opposed. So let's see what people in this room think. If you are in favor of the law recognizing same-sex marriage, raise the yellow. And if you are against, raise the gray. Well, I see a sea of yellow <laughs> with only a small handful of gray signs. So, let's now hear, let's hear first, since there's a small minority who raised the gray sign, I want to begin with the minority and have someone, see if there's someone who will share his or her view um, against the law instituting same-sex marriage. Will someone begin our discussion? Someone who is against the law recognizing same-sex marriage. Is there some brave person? <laughs> because if you don't present the argument, I'll have to present it. Hi, I'm James. I think that marriage as we know it is a very particular, specific way in which we can experience intimacy, mostly two monogamous people who share property. Um, together. And I think that the institution of marriage provides a lot of social and uh, legal benefits to a couple. And in so doing, it can, it necessarily doesn't provide those to a lot of other people who have different ways of experiencing intimacy that isn't very specifically monogamous, uh, land sharing type of, of relationship. But the issue here is mon not monogamy. It's right, whether right. It's the opposite sex can marry. Right. Uh, uh, whether so, only the opposite sex can so marry. So I think that in, in extending the institution of marriage, we normalize that these benefits uh, should only be uh, extended to people who want to participate in marriage, whereas the only benefit, legal benefit, that really is particular to marriage is, is the right to divorce. But how, how is that different in the case of same-sex couples? They want, they want to get married, the element of intimacy is present, the element of monogamy can be as present in same-sex sure. unions as opposite-sex unions. So what's the possibly relevant moral difference that you have in mind? The difference that I... What I have in mind is that in extending the right to marriage, we seem to be agreeing as a society that these benefits should be only given to people who want to participate in the institution of marriage. Right. Um, and in so doing, we discriminate against everyone who doesn't participate or doesn't want to participate in the institution of marriage. And by extending it to same-sex couples, yes. we normalize that difference. Or we say that that is something that should exist. 
Oh, so you're saying it's an implicit endorsement for the law to recognize same-sex marriage is implicitly to endorse same-sex intimacy. I, it, no, it's ex explicitly to endorse that, to endorse the rights associated with marriage should only be associated with marriage. That the, the rights to the tax rights, the rights to visitation, all these rights. Right, but the question is who should be, have access to those rights? Right. Yeah. I'm just listening and I'm hearing you say, and I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, that your argument against extending marriage rights to gay couples would be that it is imposing or reinforcing heteronormative norms on the gay community. Okay. Oh, that, that's see. what All I was right. hearing. Okay, thank you I was for just, that. I was helping clarify. That is All not right. my position. No, I understand. <laughs> okay, that's good. Thank you, thank you for that. So it might be a kind of uh, moral imperialism, imposing uh, uh, heteronormativity on same-sex couples. Um, all right, so that's one possible objection. You also have an objection. So I think uh, when it comes to these questions, uh, I want to make sure we're asking the right questions. I think in my opinion, it's not about this is right or wrong. There's nothing right or wrong to the same-sex marriage. Right. But whether or not Taiwan is ready for these institutions. So um, Taiwan is a, more like a Confucius community, even though it's democratic institutionalized. But it, it still, we have this more like collective behavior in Taiwan, where families value, fam family norms comes before individual norms, individual values. So I, I really need to be careful uh, uh, myself when I think about this question. Right. Is it's okay, like to me, there are outliers in biodiversity. We see differences. Right. One's in 10,000s, one in 100,000s is that we see uh, a gay or a lesbian. But what if this is happening in your family, especially to those in a traditional Taiwanese family? Could people actually accept it? Are we really ready for this kind of norm embedding our society? And what do you think? Well, I think we're not ready for that, for sure. Not it will probably ready. still take a decade or two decades yeah. to get there. OK, over here. My name is Jose. I'm from Honduras, and I'm a lawyer back home. Uh, we have this, we just had this discussion. And I come from a country that we tend to think a lot about God and religious aspects of this kind of discussions. But I'll try to get my comment in a really professional, scientific way from my point of view in the law. And in the law, it's meant to be followed by everyone. Right. But if we don't cover those kind of people, are they allowed to not follow the rest of the law? So you think that from the standpoint of the universality of the rule of law, yeah. it's important that the institution of marriage as a legal institution be open to same-sex couples yes. as well to as everyone. couples. To everyone, because you think that's part of, uh, that encourages respect for law as such. And it, you think it would be unjust discrimination, do you, to exclude same-sex couples from the legal institution of marriage? I agree. You think so. And what do you say to, uh, to the argument, I've, I didn't hear your name. Jason. Jason's argument that uh, Taiwan is not ready for same-sex marriage. And Jason also made the point that the Confucian tradition of the family is in some tension, tell me if I'm recalling correctly, with the idea of same-sex marriage. Do I have that right? Yes. What, what do you say to that argument? Well, that's not, a le that's not strictly about the rule yeah, of law, that's about, about whether it's... But I'm gonna tell you something. Things that, this kind of things are happening, either you like it or not. <laughs> I mean, I don't like it, and I don't have a family member that's in, that's in that situation, but I respect it, I respect it. And since it's happening, it's like murder. You don't like murder, <laughs> do you? But, but, we yeah. have to, but we have to oversee it. 
we have to have some sort of control about that. Wow. Well, all right. So let me see if I understand. <laughs> now we've been we've been noticing various arguments by analogy. This is quite a dramatic argument by analogy. <laughs> If I understand what you're saying, what's your name again, Jose? Jose. Jose is, <laughs> you are saying, if I understand you, that you favor legal recognition of same-sex marriage. Uh, you regard it yourself as morally objectionable, like murder even, but since murder happens, no, no, no. I, and uh, what? I don't regard myself, I don't regard myself in opposition of it. I just don't have the um, experience about it. But you're saying that murder is a fact, we better learn to live with it. And yeah. likewise, yeah. same-sex unions are a matter of fact, we better learn to live with it. Yeah, that's, that's what I would call a not very robust defense of same-sex marriage. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all right, fair enough. I want to see now, we've heard a few Objections. Uh, does someone, would someone else like to uh, add another objection beyond the ones that we've heard? Objection to same-sex marriage. Let's, is there anyone who hasn't yet spoken? An objection to same-sex marriage. Yes, go ahead. I觉得就我对法律的理解,过去我们都认为说法律之所以有别于道德跟伦理,是因为法律的执行是有警察,然后有法院。来执行法律 I see. So the, uh, Helen is saying she doesn't agree with same-sex marriage being legalized because the law requires us to do certain things. But marriage, people can get married on their own without having to bring the law into it. Yes, I've got it now. All right. Um, so, uh, but Helen, what I still don't quite understand on your view uh, Same-sex couples should be able to get married privately, but should they enjoy by all of the privileges that the law confers upon uh, people who uh, are engaged in a traditional marriage? The law enters in deciding certain tax implications, uh, certain benefits for married couples. The law does enter marriage in those respects. If you're suggesting that same-sex marriage can be done privately without legal endorsement or sanction, what about all of the uh, privileges that the law, that the society confers on Couples who are married in the traditional way. Should same-sex couples enjoy all of those privileges, do you think? Okay. 然后我们就直接要去修所有跟所有人有关系的法律，这这个呃跟Jason的看法有一点点接近，就是会觉得好像我们还没有在那个步骤上，好像一下跳太多了。Okay, all right. And did you you had an objection also that you wanted? You're all right. Do you want to tell us? Okay, I think marriage is a private contract of two individuals and therefore should not be effective, should be effective even without governmental supervision and agreement. So, well, all right, this in a way connects to what I thought I heard Helen saying, that marriage is a private arrangement. It's an agreement between two persons. And if that's the case, the law should not endorse or affirm um, this person's, th this, the, this couple's marriage or that, or that couple's marriage. 
Is that uh, yes, and I think that should apply to traditional, traditional marriage as well. And so you think that the state should not endorse or recognize anybody's marriage? <laughs> no way. Yes. Yes, that is what. See, I thought that's what he was saying. And t tell me your name again. Oh, Raymond. Raymond. Yes. Okay. So. Raymond raises actually a third alternative. <laughs> the traditional debate, and we see this in Taiwan and we see this around the world, the traditional debate is between those who want the state to endorse same-sex marriage and those who want the state to endorse only marriage between a man and a woman. But Raymond's suggestion, and this has arisen at the edges of debates around the world, is why should the state endorse or recognize or affirm any particular kind of marriage? Maybe the state should get out of the business of conferring recognition on marriage at all, and allow all marriage to be a kind of private arrangement, perhaps within religious communities, for those who follow the uh, certain religious traditions, perhaps outside of religious communities for those who want to get married that way. One, one way of describing Raymond's third alternative to same-sex or traditional marriage is to say that marriage should be, so to speak, privatized, <laughs> no longer recognized by the state. Now, lying behind this idea, well, is I suppose the impulse to get around the intense moral controversy that arises when societies debate what the laws of marriage should be. And also underlying this suggestion may be a philosophical idea that says the role of the state should not be to pass moral judgment, to honor and recognize this or that way of forming a family. The role of the state should be neutral with respect to the choices individuals make. So this would be, I suppose, the underlying moral idea of Raymond's proposal, if I understand it correctly, is that a more thoroughgoing, consistent, liberal philosophy of the state would have the state try to be neutral with respect to controversial judgments about how to form families, about what sorts of unions between persons and intimacies are morally legitimate or not. Now, to explore this, what's interesting is that the mainstream debate about marriage and about same-sex marriage is between those who want to claim the recognition and affirmation of the political community as a whole. It's between those who see marriage as a public, not a purely private activity. So in order to evaluate the privatizing proposal of Raymond as a way of dealing with marriage, we would have to think through together the larger philosophical question of whether it is part of the role of the state or the political community to confer honor and recognition on certain ways of life, including certain forms of family life, or whether a just society is one in which the state is non-judgmental. I'd like to put to you a different kind of case. It's about new technology and about the growing role of technology in our lives. Now, some of you may have watched 
movies on Netflix. Yes? And, and have you seen how after you watch a certain number of movies, they recommend to you, based on your previous choices, the movies they think you will like. <laughs> have you followed those recommendations? And are they usually right? Or yes. they, predict, they predict what movies you will like by getting to know you, so to speak. It's all a kind of machine learning, an algorithm that tries to predict the movies you will like based on the movies you've seen and maybe how you've rated those movies. Now, artificial intelligence and machine learning is improving, they are improving very rapidly. Suppose that an app were developed with a very sophisticated algorithm that could take all of the information you provided, including all of the personal data embodied in your email, your Facebook account, your online searches, all this data is available about you. And suppose you feed it into the app, and the app generates recommendations, not of what movies you will like, but of the three potential marriage partners <laughs> who will be the best match for you anywhere in the world. And now let's suppose the algorithm is even more sophisticated than the one that recommends movies you will like. We'll call it the Marriage Prediction App. <laughs> and it, it identifies three finalists. Here's my question. How many of you, would you, here's my question, would you trust the recommendations of the Marriage Prediction App more or than the advice of marriage partners offered by your parents? <laughs> That's what I'd like to see your, your vote on. Now, raise the yellow sign if you would trust the app, the marriage prediction app, more than your parents. And raise the gray if you would trust your parents more than the app. I see a lot of yellow cards. <laughs> I see a, a maybe 20 or 30 gray cards. All right, who can explain why? Who will tell us? Yes. Uh, my name is Rubin. Yeah. And I believe that whether you choose to believe in your parents or you choose to believe in the app, uh, the basic essence of uh, the prediction is a set of algorithm, and to me, I believe that the algorithm of the app would be more precise than those of my parents, depending on... More depending precise? On, yes, because my parents are human, and humans are bound to predict things in the wrong direction. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and that's, uh, but I believe that it's just a technical problem. If, it's a uh, technical problem who if, you will marry? What? It's a technical problem whom you will marry? It's just an algorithm. It's an algorithm. Love is just a, just a after effect of hormones, all right? Love, yes. wait, let me make sure that I understand this. Love, even love, uh, can be determined by an algorithm. Yes. No, my idea is that um, the, uh, even if you are to let your parents decide whether who you are to marry, your parent decides that uh, person by right. algorithm, by oh, human even, algorithm. So even the parent is using a kind of informal algorithm by, uh, by actually relying on certain rules w uh, about whom you liked in the past, about what your tendencies are. So even the parental recommendation yes. is based on certain rules or general yes. principles. For example, 
If your parents were making a recommendation for you, what sorts of rules or principles would they implicitly be relying on? Be relying on? Uh, maybe the belief, the religious belief of the partner or the, the wealth or just the personality. Okay, religion, wealth, personality. Yes. Is what your parents might have in mind when they make uh, their recommendations. Not my parents. Not your parents. <laughs> Why? What would they consider? They consider that I chase my love by myself. They don't enforce their recommendation on me. So, they don't enforce yeah. it, no. But here it's just a recommendation. Yes. So if they recommend, they will be using such things as religion, wealth. I just and put some examples. Right, and, and for example. And in yeah. principle, a machine could do that better. Yes. In a more sophisticated... All right. Uh, who disagrees with Ruby? Um, yes, Dunt. Hi. So I actually also said that I would choose the app over my parents, but my logic was just that the app would have a larger selection, whereas your parents know fewer people. <laughs> so, but I disagree with that because I think there's a level of human interaction that is necessary because not everything is black and white, I don't think an algorithm can solve everything. I don't think an app can determine, I don't think a technological algorithm can determine human interaction more accurately than an actual human being. Can predict, but we're talking about predicting, not determining. Why can an algorithm not, in principle, predict who will be the best partner for you? I think they can there would be a way to predict, like, you can pick out things that are similar. An algorithm can put things together. Right. But even just with what's available of your personal data online, that doesn't fully encompass your beliefs or you as a person. So there's always going to be more nuance in you as a human being than there is in the data available about you. And you think you. your parents will be better at getting at that nuance than the app? I think you and the... No, I think the app has a better selection. I don't think even another human... I don't think my parents would know me perfectly as a human, but I think the app has they a do, They do know you, or do not know you perfectly. <laughs> no, they do not know me perfectly. Right. But... But would it be different, let me, what's your name? Savannah. Savannah, would it be different if instead of your parents, I said your friends, your best friends? Yes. <laughs> so there you would trust the friend more than the app. I still think the app has, act I would value both, but if I do pick one over the other, yeah. I, and it's just, you know, for an initial, like, see if it works, I think the app would have just access to a larger pool, so the Chance you, of you it would, working better would like... You would go with the app even over the friend, never mind your parents. I mean, I think I would realistically go with both, but I just think the app does provide like a larger pool. All right. <laughs> well, numbers um, game. <laughs> I think that uh, in your idea, it all comes down to an uh, idea that uh, how well the person that is predicting your partner knows about you. If your parents knows about you perfectly, they will be able to predict your uh, future partner very precisely, I guess. Uh, if, that, if your friends knows you perfectly, they will be able to predict, uh, predict precisely. Am I right? Yeah, I think there's just but so much... Oh, sorry. If a computer can, does know you better than your parents or your, or your best friend, couldn't they predict your future partner better than them? Because the way of how they predict whether it's a human or computer is by a set of algorithm. The computer has algorithm in electrons. We have algorithms in our neurons. And it's, it's just the same. Yes. It's all electrons I, and neurons yes. bouncing around. Yes. And the app can better organize and know. If the, suppose the computer knows you as well as your parents, couldn't they decide better? All right, what, all right that's the issue of principle. What do you say to that? I just find it hard to believe that the nuance of human interaction and conscience could be boiled down to numbers in an algorithm. Is well, what I, I mean, maybe right. some people believe that. I just find it hard all to right, believe. All right, let's see if there's someone else who disagrees with, what, what's your name again? Ruby. With Ruby. 
Someone, someone who uh, disagrees in principle with Ruby. Hello, my name is Eliza. Um, where I disagree is the level of trust and human ability to change. So, what I'm saying is, if somebody comes along and they tell their parents all these things, and their parents have the ability to watch you change from baby all the way up to 24, I think that parent is going to have a better chance than if you go with the algorithm and you type everything in for only like 30 seconds. That algorithm will not be able to figure out all the details of your change. Is that just because the parent has more data, so to speak? Yes, that's what I'm saying. And <laughs> now, that, that's the thing. If you're yes. saying that, oh, this algorithm has the same amount of data, yeah, okay, that's great. But then so how do you collect the data? Oh, well, but you're conceding a lot to Ruby when you say that parental understanding or knowledge mm -hmm. of the child is just a matter of data, and the only question is whether they have more of it than the algorithm has. You're conceding quite a lot there, aren't you? What do you think, Ruby? Doesn't that still, <laughs> I mean, doesn't, you mentioned that the problem is whether the computer can collect the same amount of data as your parents, mm -hmm. but doesn't that still come down to a technical just a technical problem. That's a technical, that's why if I say you're conceding a, a lot. It's a technical mm. matter. Okay, which fine. Can gather I'll switch my argument. No, no. <laughs> but do you, is there some, no, it's, it's a fair point, but is there some, if it's all data and all rules, then in principle, the algorithm, the app, could aggregate more data and run the algorithm more efficiently. That's Ruby's claim. Is there anyone who, who wants to challenge Ruby's underlying assumption and claim that knowing a person well enough to predict their best lifelong mate um, is not a matter of rules or algorithms or even data, however much data might be aggregated? Is there anyone who wants to challenge that assumption? I think it really depends on how advanced the algorithm is in deciding that, and I like to think that maybe we think we're closer to being able to make those decisions through algorithms than we maybe are. And then it also brings in mind a moral question of, does this algorithm decide who you'll be the most happy with? Does this algorithm decide who you'll make the most societal change with? So it also brings into question those kind of moral ideas. And the parent, uh, how, what's the parent deciding? happiness or contribution to the common good? The parents are probably deciding what they want most. <laughs> what they want most. People or what they think you want most. Uh, all right, Is, uh, any, I want to hear an, uh, any other objection in principle to the algorithmic notion of love and knowing a person. Yes. Hi, my name is Jia He. Um, I, I want to say something about the algorithm the algorithm thing because I read somewhere in an, in, in, in an article uh, which says that um, the, art, the article um, basically explains why AlphaGo always win. You know, do, do you guys know what AlphaGo is? Yes, okay, okay. So, and then the writer um, concludes that the, the very reason why, why AlphaGo always win is, be, is because it does not have emotions. Uh, people might, might, might have emotions, and then, for example, they can be, uh, I don't know, uh, fretted, right. or, or while, while they are, you know, uh, uh, during the games. But as a machine, it does not have emotions. So I have the same claim about whatever app that can predict your best partner, because, you know, even though it has a, the most advanced algo, 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 whatever? Yes, algorithm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. But um, it cannot tell if that person, you know, uh, for example, w what is the temperance of that person, or if this, uh, or if this person uh, gets angry very easily, or is it is, is this person a, a you know a good guy to be with? So these are the things that this app, no matter how. Uh, how much this app knows about you, they, they, they cannot, you know, tell you about the other... And that's, yes, and that's right. because, and you're suggesting that this is because of what is generally a strength of machines and algorithms, 
that they is 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 actually is actually its weakness. It's uh, it's its weakness in this context. Yes. The 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 lack of emotion. Right. So the reason a machine can beat a go champion is that it has no emotion. It just calculates. Right. Yes. And that quality that emotionless quality makes an app even in principle unqualified to choose my lifelong right mate. that's what i'm saying yes. because it can't because it lacks emotion or insight into human emotions it couldn't possibly predict or understand how the couple might grow and change together for example no i don't think so you no. don't think it could no and whereas a friend or maybe even a parent <laughs> might be blinded by certain of their emotions but also might be given a certain kind of insight into me and also me. there's wisdom yeah wisdom Right. I mean, for example, for example, if a friend or a parent, they can give you the wisdom that they have. Yes. And you think that wisdom is not something that even a smart machine no. can have? No. Because you think wisdom is in part has an emotional component. What do you say to that, Ruby? That's pretty powerful. I still think that it just comes down to a technical problem because a technical now, problem. nowadays we don't have a, po a computer strong enough to mimic a uh, human's emotion or a wisdom, as you might say. But in the future, there might be such a computer. So, so that's in the future. <laughs> what, what did you say? Sorry, sorry. That's in the future. So, no, so but I thought no, you were no. saying that future is not even possible no, in principle. Well, actually, no. But uh, we are talking about this philosophical problem in the same principle. We, if, we, if not, and then this problem would not, we, not exist. So, you, in let, the future, it must exist. All right, or let me ask you this. We're now, you're confident that in the future, in principle, yes. we could invent smart machines and yes. apps so smart that they would include in their judgments wisdom, even love. Yes. Do you think it would be, let's suppose you're right about that for the sake of argument. Do you think that a world where machines could predict such things as wisdom and even love, uh, would that be a better world than the one that we <laughs> currently inhabit? Mm, that is hard to say for me, but... It's hard to uh, say. But it, it's I would say, I would predict that... Um, no, but now not predicting. Now judging, evaluating, uh, judging. would that be a better world? A world in which machines could not only be smarter than us at Go, what but also wiser than us and what capable. Is, what do you mean by better? Well, would you rather live in that kind of world than the one we live in now? Um, I'm, I may not. You may not. But that is me. The def definition of better yeah. is quite um, complex and it complicated. Is. Yes, it and is. It's, it's, uh, it shouldn't be judged by me or of w whether it is better or not. Because, okay. like I said, what is better? Do uh, if a world full of machines that is as good as, good as human right. uh, can produce uh, can resulting in a better efficiency of a human society. Better and efficiency. If that is better for somebody, yes. that is better for that guy. But if I want a society that's full of human, and that is better for me. So I can't really say that what is actually better. But for me, I would rather like a more humane society. Okay, yes. thank you all. Thank you for everyone who joined in this discussion of the Marriage Prediction app. This last exchange raises Yet another big philosophical question. Well, what is better? And that is a difficult question. And people disagree. What is a better way to live?
to answer the question in the context of smart machines is to ask, is there anything that makes human life and human wisdom and human love special, especially important? Or is it all a matter of efficiency? We can't really answer the question of better. I think Rubin is right, unless we figure out what we mean by a good life, which in a way takes us back to the suggestion with which I began. We are, we've developed a bad habit in our public discourse, and this is true in societies around the world. We tend to shy away from engaging in public discourse with big ethical questions, questions about justice, about the common good, about what makes for a good life, questions about what makes for a better way of life. We tend to shy away from those questions, I think, for at least a couple of reasons. First, we know that in pluralist societies, people disagree. Disagree about the meaning of marriage or about how to deal with pensions or nuclear waste. People disagree about ultimate questions of the good life. And to avoid disagreement, certainly among politicians, but even among the rest of us, there's a tendency to say, let's avoid controversial questions about values in public discourse. Let's agree to disagree. And then there's also an argument we heard that reinforces that habit of avoidance the habit of avoiding contested moral questions in politics. It's the idea of not judging. Living and letting live, we don't want to be intolerant. So even though you or I might have a certain view about this or that practice, we don't want to decide collectively how to judge or how to evaluate. Isn't it better, according to this argument, isn't it better to try to make the law as neutral as possible toward moral judgments on which we may disagree? This came up powerfully in the discussion about same-sex marriage. It came up in the discussion even about prostitution. So the impulse not to judge for fear of being intolerant, the impulse not to engage in contested arguments about the good life, to avoid controversy and disagreement. These are powerful tendencies. But I say it's a bad habit. It's a bad habit because it leads to a public discourse that is empty, that is hollow of larger moral meaning. And I think it's that emptiness that explains the dissatisfaction and the frustration with the empty terms of public discourse around the world. People want public life and public discourse to be about big things that matter. And so I think it's not possible and it's not desirable to conduct our public life without engaging in debate about big moral questions. But what about a tolerant society? What about pluralism? Isn't this the worry? Well, it depends what you mean by mutual respect among citizens. One way of understanding mutual respect is the respect of avoidance. I'll set aside our disagreements. We won't get into them. We'll ask citizens to leave their moral and spiritual convictions outside when they enter the public square. That's one idea of mutual respect. But I think a deeper kind of mutual respect of difference comes not from avoiding, but from engaging with 
the competing moral and spiritual convictions our fellow citizens bring with them to public life, to engage with them, to reason together, to learn together, to disagree together. There can be a kind of civility and mutual respect, even in disagreement. We saw, we saw this in the debates, the discussions we had, where people held up sometimes the yellow sign, sometimes the gray sign. But that was the beginning, not the end, of the discussion we had. And we saw how the discussions we had on particular issues led to broader questions about the meaning of a just society and the relation between ethics and law and the meaning of freedom and free choice and the role of the political community in shaping or refusing to shape the moral judgments of its citizens. And so what I think our discussions here illustrate is the possibility of reasoning together in public about big moral questions that matter, but doing it in a way that respects those differences, that sometimes learns from them, rather than in a way that tears us apart. My hope, my wish, my dream even for our societies is that we learn from this example, not because engaging with our moral disagreements will lead to unanimity, but instead because engaging with one another on big questions with which we may disagree on which we may disagree with one another will make for a better public life and will make all of us better citizens. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Fulbright Taiwan would like to thank Dr. Sandel for demonstrating how our regular concerns reflect ethical choices and for engaging so effectively how you stimulated members of the audience to express themselves on tough issues was wonderful. The ability to debate and still maintain a civil discourse is a skill we increasingly need to cultivate. We hope you join with us in Senator Fulbright's vision of a world with a little more knowledge and a little less conflict.